عمر انت لسه بغزه انا بالقاهرة طلعت في منتصف اكتوبر ليلى بس طبعا انا انا قاعد I think we're we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so, uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening to those of us uh, to, to those who are joining uh, from overseas uh, and welcome. Uh, I'm Khalid Al Gindi. I'm the director of uh, the program on Palestine and Palestinian Israeli affairs here at the Middle East Institute, and I'm I'm pleased to be moderating today's webinar. on the future of Palestinian politics in the wake of the Gaza war, which um, obviously, as most people know, is, is ongoing. After some 150 days, uh, Israel's relentless assault on Gaza has resulted in more than 30,000 dead, including 12,000 children, destroyed most of Gaza's civilian infrastructure, uprooted some 1.5 million people and brought most of Gaza's 2.3 million inhabitants to the brink of famine, but so far has failed to achieve its stated goal of eliminating Hamas. Although Hamas is likely to survive the onslaught in Gaza, its future along with that of the rival uh, Fatah faction and the Palestinian leadership of Mahmoud Abbas, as well as the Palestinian national movement as a whole, remain uncertain. While Uh, U.S., Arab, and even Israeli leaders debate the future of post-war Gaza. It is Palestinians themselves who will shape the future of their politics and political institutions, including in Gaza. To help us better how Pal to help us better understand how Palestinians are thinking about the future of their own politics, we've assembled a, a really stellar panel of experts. I'll introduce them uh, briefly here, but you can um, check out their full bios. Uh, on the event page uh, for this event. Um, first, uh, we have Dr. Leila Farsakh, um, Associate Professor and Chair of the Political Science Department at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Also joining us is Omar Shaban, who is the founder and director of PalThink for Strategic Studies, which is a Gaza-based think tank, and he is joining us uh, from Cairo, Egypt. And third, we have uh, Obada Shteya, who is the co-founder and CEO of the Institute for Social and Economic Progress, which is based in the West Bank, and he is joining us from here in Washington. Uh, so welcome to you all. Um, I'll start off the discussion with some questions for each of the panelists, uh, and then toward the end, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, please submit your questions. using the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. And I'll try to work in as many of your questions uh, as I can into the discussion. And so with that, um, let's uh, go ahead and, and get started. Um, I want to start with you, Omar, um, because um, uh, as someone who was up, up until fairly recently in Gaza uh, and who still has family there, um, The images and videos and testimonies of the past five months coming out of Gaza have been absolutely gut-wrenching and, and heartbreaking. Uh, and yet we know uh, that they don't even begin to capture the scale and depth of the kind of suffering and uh, destruction uh, and death that has taken place. Maybe get us started by telling us a little bit about what it's been like for you uh, and your uh, loved ones in Gaza um, these past uh, these past five months. Um, and, and also if I could add to that um, kind of scene setter, most analysts I think agree that Israel's stated goal of destroying Hamas uh, is not achievable, although some still do. And in fact, many Israelis still believe that. Um, if you could add as part of your answer, tell us why the goal of destroying Hamas is not realistic and, and what it means even to try and pursue such an unattainable goal. Thank you very much, Khalid, for inviting me and good evening to everybody. And uh, I'm very happy always to talk with you. 
it's not easy to it's not easy to find the wall to describe the situation of our people in Gaza. Whatever you see in the media, in the news, don't reflect the extremely bad situation in Gaza that started in the 7th of October. I left Gaza two months ago where my family is out, but my sister and my brothers and my friends. It's very it's an unbearable situation. When you go to the Facebook, you see that some of your friends are killed. The Facebook has turned to be like cemetery. Every minute you find somebody who is killed, intellectual, journalists, professors, normal people, worker. And the humanitarian situation is beyond description. As everybody seen, the the the, the humanitarian said that Allah into Gaza covers only eight percent of the Gaza people if the Gaza need. In Rafah area, which is 60 kilometers square, there were 1.3 million Palestinian, and more, all of them or most of them they live in tenant. They don't have any any uh, infrastructure. They don't have sanitation. They don't have water. They don't have electricity. The, the humanitarian situation is more difficult to women and children. There are thousands of pregnant women who don't know where to go because there is only eight hospital out of 36 hospital are working, not all of them in Gaza. There are some field hospital that were built uh, some Arab countries in Rafa area, but this is our emergency hospital. And there are around 60,000 children who need special food. I was talking here today, I'm in Cairo, I met with some international, I met with some Palestinian. There is shortage of milk, shortage of milk to, to the children. There are shortage of some special medicine. And people are crying for this medicine. We try to help them to find them in Cairo and to send them into Gaza. There are two problems. One is to find them in the Egyptian market here. Second problem is how to channel them into Gaza because there is huge restriction and difficulties in entering medicine into Gaza uh, society. As we talk now, 30,000 Palestinians were killed. 12,000 of them are children under 16 years old. Those people who were born or were five years old when Hamas took over. They don't know anything about Hamas or about other things. 12,000 children. And maybe the same number from women. So in total, 30,000, 70% of them are women. In addition to some 70,000 people who are injured, Many of them are losing their life because they don't have the medical equipment. I live in Del Balah in the middle area. There is only one hospital there, Al-Aqsa Hospital, which serves now 700,000 people. 700,000 people. The number of patients are 10 times of the capacity of this hospital. The number of casualties of in Gaza are too much to be to cope with the medic, the, the most advanced medical system. If this number of casualties in any country like UK or in America or in France, it wouldn't be able to cope with. So you can imagine how difficult it is for an area which is very little. Many people who hear Gaza in the news they think Gaza is big as big countries. Gaza is too small. It's 200 square mile. 362 kilometers square, inhabited by 2, 2 million, 0.3 million people, is one of the highest populated area on earth. So when the Israeli asked the, the people who live in Gaza and the north to move to, move to Khan Yunis and to the south, I mean, you squeezed 2 million people in 30 or 40 percent of the Gaza. Of course, in the Gaza and the south, 70% of the houses were demolished totally. I read in the Facebook today, somebody from Khan Yunis who went around and he described the situation. He said the situation in Gaza is like it was bombarded by atomic bomb. Atomic bomb. More than 20,000 ton of bombardment were shelled into Gaza. 20,000 ton in an area of 200 kilometers square. So you can imagine how each meter square receive this. And the level of bombing is very, very, very heavy. 
Two days ago, they bombed a mosque close to my house, 200 meters. All the glasses, the glass were broken. All the windows were getting out. And my house lived there. There are 30 people live in my house. And thanks God, till now, it's okay. So this is, uh, the people in Gaza and the north are starving from hang from uh, from nothing, getting food. And as we said, food has been weaponized. It becomes a weapon. So it, was, it becomes as a weapon. And now people are not suffering from the bombardment because the bombardment in the past couple of weeks has been decreased because there is no target. When the Israelis said, we targeted 20,000 target in Gaza. Gaza is not Ukraine. Ukraine is 600,000 kilometers square. It's 200 times of Gaza. Gaza is 200 kilometers, 362 kilometers square. So when you talk about 20,000, is there any country has 20,000 military target? I mean, this couldn't happen even in the US, which has 50 states. We don't wish any bad for any people. We love everybody and we wish the safety and the health and the prosperity for everybody in this universe. The American, the British, everybody, but we want them to be stand with us. Now, this situation, and I wonder, as a Palestinian, I wonder how some state, some country like US, voted against a decision to stop killing. How they describe this? I, I talked with some American diplomat. I was in Brussels three days ago. There is a big, big, big question about how the Palestinian become confident in the international law. How the Palestinian can trust the international community. Oh, and we can talk about it in the second round of the questions. I mean, what does mean the international law, the international humanitarian law to the Palestinian? I'm a person who believe in dialogue have been into America, have been talking to many, many international, because I believe in dialogue. But can you imagine, can we, our people who lost their parents and their father and houses and are starving? And for people who don't know, Gaza used to be one of the richest area in the, in the Middle East. The GDP in Gaza, as an economist, the GDP in Gaza was one of the best in the Middle East. Gaza used to export money and to export the flour, and to export carnation, and to export ice cream, and to export the clothes, not only to the Arab world, but to America, and to the Mark Spencer and Washington in the UK, and many other countries. And Gaza used to export herbs, herbs from Gaza greenhouses to America. So Gaza used to be a very rich place, and can you imagine now Gaza people are starving for food? Last statement, just to give you the pulse. I made some cash to some assistant to my families and to my neighborhood in Gaza two weeks, two days, two, three days ago. And I asked my nephew to buy meat. I received a phone call and SMS from some of my neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Omar. My children, it's the first time for them to eat meat for the in the past five months. These people used to eat meat three times a week. It was for them the first time to eat meat in the, for the bar since the war started. And the, the, the situation in the ground is beyond description. And I don't know how this civilized war can allow this to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Omar, for that very sobering uh, picture. Um, Obada, I, I want to turn to you and, and ask you, what, what has it been like for people in the West Bank, uh, which uh, with where you where you're ordinarily based, both both in terms of of having to watch these horrors inflicted on their brethren in Gaza, and in terms of what is happening in the West Bank, stepped up violence and repression by the army, by settlers, uh, and so and so on. As part of that, um, some people are talking about a third intifada. Is that a possibility? And, and where does all of this leave the leadership of Mahmoud Abbas and his PA? Can they survive uh, politically, given what's what's happening now? I mean, people are, you know, the goal is to destroy Hamas, supposedly, but uh, the reality may be that they're actually destroying whatever may be left of the PA. Thank you, Khaled. Um, thank you for inviting me. And, and um, it's such a pleasure to be on this panel with um, you all, with Omar and, and Leila. 
Um, the situation in the West Bank is, as you know, is also difficult. Honestly, it's it's hard though um, to compare, even to begin to think about the difficulties in the West Bank compared to to what's happening in Gaza. I myself, our our organization, uh, and and many other organizations, civil society organizations that I'm plugged into in the West Bank, uh, we all have staff in Gaza. We lost um, quite a few of them. Um, I am on on the uh, I'm a co-founder of a media channel progressive media channel in Palestine called Masaha. Uh, we were actually uh, filming, we, we were doing this project to reshape the narrative within Gaza based on, on reality, based on the fact that Gaza's history started thousands and thousands of years ago. And, and all these places that we filmed are now destroyed. And the saddest part actually is that the lady, um, our, our colleague who was leading this project uh, is not with us anymore. She was killed with her family in, in Northern Gaza. So it's extremely devastating to see to see that happen. Um, she was just one of of many. So within our close circles, we we lost six people in Gaza. Um, so it, it is just an extremely difficult situation. Um, in the West Bank, people are devastated. So our survey, uh, when when and we we did three surveys. One has not been been released, but it's it's being collected now. We almost have the numbers. From the first survey to the second to the third, the level of helplessness is going up. The The number one feeling on the street in the West Bank is helplessness. Um, people basically are uh, devastated to see what's happening, but at the same time, they're unable to do anything. They're unable to do anything. Um, even, even a question in the survey, we asked people, what, what do you think, what's the best way to help from your perspective that's also possible? People talked about donating. Um, to 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 um, be, to the humanitarian crisis basically in Gaza, but the political situation in the West Bank does not seem to allow you know a, a, the big demonstrations or or further escalation, despite quite a bit of escalation which uh, took place all over the West Bank, including Jenin and and uh, Tulkarim and Nablus in specific. Uh, economically, um, as you all know, the, uh, the there's a serious number of uh, Palestinians around 17 percent of of uh, the labor force was in working in Israel bringing in nearly 40 percent of of the national income uh, that is gone um as you know the salaries um the the PA employees have not been properly receiving salaries I think they're now at 65 percent last thing uh, they received they, they they're not receiving their salaries and that that negative trickle down to the economy is also making the situation uh, extremely difficult in the West Bank um also last point on on the situation in the west bank is now the freedom of movement we're back to second intifada basically i remember growing up when i was um 10 and 12 and 14 15 going to ramallah was not possible so i i grew up in nablus going to Ram i just simply didn't go to ramallah until, until after 2008 um when the um crisis began to loosen up Sorry, and checkpoints uh, began to be removed. Uh, now we're back there. So going from Nablus to Ramallah, which usually takes 45 minutes to an hour, now takes three to four hours just because there's this checkpoint and people are lined up. It's like the day of judgment at, at the checkpoint if you if you look at the lines. Um, uh, so lack of freedom of movement, the, even the bridge, the crossing is um, limited hours. So the situation has deteriorated quite a bit. Now, with um the with the palestinian authority i think even so previously there's there's this perception that the palestinian authority is is israel's partner and israel is invested in the continuation of the palestinian authority i think most analysts i would say today doubt that i think it's, it's pretty clear especially with the extreme right wing government the extreme ministers i don't think they want any kind of of palestinian entity um i mean it also one of the, the biggest fears um, and, and, and wishes of, of these right-wing extremists uh, is to actually displace everybody. Um, so this is to, to say that, that you know, anybody that the Israelis are invested in the PA, I don't think is realistic anymore. The PA itself is, is having a um, difficult time. And also the fact that there hasn't been any reform by the PA for a long time, there hasn't been election by the PA in a long time, makes it even more and more complicated. Whether it's going to survive, that's a big question, um, which I don't have the answer to. 
But what I can tell you is that in our survey, we asked, um, we believe is, is a really interesting question. We hear a lot about how Palestinians want to dissolve the PA. Um, and we basically took that question and, in a sense, turned it on its head to see whether that is true or not. Uh, so we provided the material alternatives to dissolving the PA. So we asked people, OK, you, do you want to? So the, the options are uh, which of the following um, steps would you take uh, in regards to governance in Palestine? Would you would you reform the PLO, the PA and keep it? Would you dissolve the P P PLO, PA, and give governance to Israel? Would you give dissolve it and give governance to Egypt uh, slash Jordan? Or even give governance to the people and to the municipalities? 70% of the public wants to reform the PLO and, and the PA. What that tells you is that people don't dislike the institutions. Uh, these are Palestinian institutions which were built by Palestinians over a long time. They were built based on political achievement from, from the, the, the first intifada, and people want to keep these, they just want to reform them. Um, so, but, so this is one question. And on the flip side, if you look at the approval ratings of the leaders, none of the traditional leaders that we have now, basically the establishment, got anything more than 20%. Uh, most of them are actually were between 7 uh, and then, then 12 and 13%, including the, pri the prime minister, um, we didn't ask about President Abbas, but but Shikaki as about President Abbas many times. We know it's it's uh, it's very low, but also the rest of the establishment. So basically, you got a situation now where people want the system, they want the the institution because that's something that they built over time with with a political price and 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 and, and price and blood in a sense in the intifadas, and at the same time they do not necessarily approve the leaders. So. So I guess the question is, do the leader, does the Palestinian leadership save itself or does it save the institution and, and reform and um, go for elections? Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Leila, I want to want to turn to you next as a as an expert uh, on Palestinian politics and history. Could you help situate this moment for us kind of historically in time uh, in the context of the broader Palestinian national struggle and historical experience? Is this another Nakba? Um, and how is the devastation and collective trauma um, of, of Gaza's destruction likely to reshape Palestinian politics going forward? I, I know that's asking you to kind of uh, look into a crystal ball, but, but just given past experience, where is this moment in the context of Palestinian history? Uh, thank you very much. And thank you also for the co-panelist. Um, Yes, um, both at the political level and at the national level, this is a major turning point in our history. This is the largest Nakba we've witnessed, I think, in terms of the scale of destruction and displacement. Uh, the Nakba of Gaza is as bad, if not as worse, than 1948. 48 uh, was the displacement of us Palestinians from our homeland. Uh, this one is another attempt to displace us, but it's also a war of genocidal intent that we've never seen before. And that's something uh, not only scary, it's it's alarming, it's inhumane, it's unjustifiable in the 21st century where we said we would never have th things like that by the international community. The international community has built an international structure and a legal structure to prevent any such massive destruction. So uh, uh, historically, definitely, it is the, one of the worst moments in our history since uh, the Second World War, definitely. It's also very uh, scary in terms of what's happening on the Palestinian leadership and the politi political leadership. Uh, it's alarming because we are living a situation of fragmentation of the leadership that is very petrifying. It's it's. It made some people, and I would argue it's even worse than the situation was in 48 with Haj Amin Hosseini. Uh, that's alarming because uh, we need right now a unified Palestinian leadership, and that's something we don't have. Um, Abayda talked very beautifully about the importance of the institutions. The Palestinians are attached to their institution, the PLO, which was created in 1964 and was taken over by the Palestinian guerrilla movement in 1968. 
has been the representative of the Palestinian people, has done amazing work in terms of unifying the Palestinian people during the diaspora. If we, if we think about it, you know, the, you know, in, in 1974, the majority of the Palestinians were in the refugee camps. The PLO was based in the refugee camp, and we got international recognition by the international community that the Palestinians have a right to self-determination. The PLO was admitted into the United Nations as an observer. So we have the incredible institution called the PLO. We have an also peace process, which we entered hoping we can create a Palestinian state. And what has happened after 30 years of also peace process is the killing of the two-state solution. It's the only solution we have, but de facto what has happened because of Israel's settlements and expansion of its colonial domination and fragmentation of the Palestinians, we have a Palestinian authority in the West Bank that has lost all legitimacy. The last time the Palestinian uh, Authority was, there was election was in 19, uh, nine, 2006. Since then we have not had, so we don't have a representative leadership. And since 2008, since the 2007 and the split between Hamas, between Gaza and the West Bank, we had fragmented leadership, a leadership of Hamas in the Gaza Strip and the leadership of Fatah in the, in the West Bank. But in both cases also what we lost, we lost any possibility for representative politics. So the PLO was, undermined and weakened and marginalized. We don't have any meeting of the Palestinian National Council. We don't have election to the Palestinian National Council. What we have is the, Palestinian, the PLO Executive Committee, which is uh, elects every now and then the same people who are in the Palestinian Authority. And despite at least five reconciliation um, attempts between Hamas and Fatah, we failed still to have a unified or common leadership. So that this fragmentation is very, very scary because it could also, why, why it is petrifying? Because right now with this genocidal onslaught happening on the Palestinian people, we need a leadership that speaks in one voice and defends the Palestinian people and their rights, which are protected by international law. And it's particularly important now because of the incredible sacrifices that the people of Gaza are paying. 30,000 people killed. We've never had that. That's the time that you have to be united. So there are attempts. We know there's a meeting in Moscow it's been, you know, to, to try to reconcile the various factions. Uh, uh, how do we move from here? I think you made it clear, uh, Khaled and others as well. Uh, we have to contend that Hamas is part of the Palestinian national movement. Hamas Israel can try to destroy it completely. Good luck with that. I doubt it can because Hamas is not just a military wing. Hamas is also a politically wing, political wing and a social infrastructure. And it is part of the Palestinian people. So that one level that's happening is attempt maybe to find a, a, a unified leadership of some, some form. Any, as you know, any discussion of the ceasefire now, any discussion of the day after of a technocratic government or not, there is a tacit understanding that the full elimination of Hamas will not be possible. But what, me, what, what is now pressing more than ever is the inclusion of Hamas in the, Palest in the PLO and in the Palestinian. Uh, we need a unified national leadership. Right. So where do I see the hope and where do I see the challenges? I think Obaida and his survey are very important because what we are also missing and what is causing also this crisis of leadership is that it's a leadership that has not been renewed for the past 15 years. It's a leadership that is not listening to how Palestine has changed. We have a completely new generation. We have a new blood that are uh, active in various ways and manifested themselves politically. Leila, then, can I, I'm sorry to, to cut you off, but I, can you hold off on that part of the, the discussion? We're going to get to that in the next two rounds of, of questions, if, if we could, on where, where we are and where things go. Um, and just to kind of move things along. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Leila, you mentioned you mentioned this uh, need for a unified Palestinian leadership and specifically the Moscow meeting. Um, Omar, I want to ask you about this meeting that took place in Moscow a few days ago or last week. Uh, the goal presumably was to try and develop a unified response to the Israeli assault on Gaza, as well as to begin to put the Palestinian political house in order. We've I think a lot of us would say, well, we've seen this movie before. We've seen uh, many, many different reconciliation agreements. They've agreed on a broad set of principles that were never implemented. 
Um, even the framework that people are talking about now, which is a technocratic government for the Palestinian Authority, in which you know all the factions consent but are not part of uh, the uh, the government, um, and in reforming the PLO to bring in Hamas and other groups that have been outside the PLO umbrella and denying it of that representative character. Uh, all of these things have been on the table for for many years, um, and and so people went to this meeting in Moscow with this goal. They came out with a statement. There was no breakthrough. There was no uh, nothing that was that was really achieved uh, beyond you know condemning Israel and and so forth. Um, is it possible, um, even if if something like what's happening now? to Palestinians, which is an existential threat, if this is not enough to force the political leaders to overcome their kind of petty differences, then then probably nothing is. Is there hope for, for anything uh, from the existing political powers of Fatah and Hamas? Uh, or are they, and are they up to this challenge? Thank you, Khaled, and then I will make myself short. And sorry for being, the connection is not uh, strong in uh, the, I'm staying in two-star hotel, so the connection is not that good. Neither Algier, neither Russia can do something for the reconciliation. They are not. Russia tried to make public relations. I have said this many, many times. They are not part of the game. They don't know much about what's going on. Algeria is very far away. They respect Palestinian, they support Palestinian, but they don't know much about the small details here and there. The reconciliation is only by Egypt, which is authorized by the Arab League. And now we talk about Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, and Qatar. But I want to jump to the other thing. We should stop talking about reconciliation. The ongoing war in Gaza is a fundamental transformational thing. It will have, I post, I bought it on the Facebook, uh, I bought small piece a couple of days ago about the longer term impact of this war. It will impact everything. The terminology, the structure, the political faction, the political mapping, the type of the leadership, and we can talk about it later. We cannot talk about reconciliation about Hamas and Fatah. We talk about Hamas has been decreased, has been beaten, has been weakened. They will not be eradicated, as I said this to officials in the U.S. a couple of weeks ago. But we talk about Hamas will also be changed, and we can talk about it later. The Palestinian Khalid has been, in the, since 2007, has been into the more, not more, but other catastrophes. And we have said all the time, guys, Hamas and Abbas, why you don't reconcile? There is a Trump plan, there is a... The Al-Aqsa problem, their fight here and there, there is Russia and Ukraine. We have been going through different difficult circumstances and both leadership, they don't, they do have the, uh, different agenda. And they think, not I think, this is what happened in the last 15 years, the Palestinian inside has become weakened and they were more, in, uh, more influential, influenced by the external element. And we need to know that we are very, very sincere and we have to be. There are some powers in the Middle East, in the region, far away from the region, are not interested in reconciliation. Do you think Iran is interested in reconciliation? I'm not sure. Do you think some anon state actors in Syria or in Lebanon are uh, interested in our reconciliation? No. Be keeping the Palestinian divide is not, all, is not good only for the Israelis who are very happy about it, and the Prime Minister Netanyahu has said this many, many times publicly, but also there are any other Arab regions. So we are weak, uh, but I don't want to, we, we blame our leadership because they need to work hard, but there are no uh, effort by the Arab, and the Arab League is very weak, and very little they are doing this, and not an not opportunity. The catastrophe in Gaza, the catastrophe, the war, the genocide, whatever you call it, is, is not enough to describe what's happening. It could lead to an opportunity. It could lead to an opportunity. And if it's not, we need to bring it. I'm here in Gaza and Cairo. There are 
for you, Khaled, and for our audience, there are 65, this is exact number, 65,000 Palestinians who exit Gaza in the past five months. Now they are in Cairo, some of them left to Canada, some of them left to Canada, to Australia. Everybody has a problem. And we can talk about it not very much, but they lost their jobs, they lost their houses, their daughters, they lost their schools. There are 8,000 Palestinian students in Gaza, in Egypt now. They stopped their schooling in Gaza, and we don't know what to do. Some of them, they have succeeded to be online with Ramallah. Thanks. But we talk about 8,000, and there is no financial support. The embassy here is very weak, and there is no fund to support the Palestinians who are in Cairo. Some of them were here for medical injuries in the Egyptian hospital, and they stuck here. And their families are either killed or could not come here, and they need money. They need $100 to buy medicine. So the, the war in Gaza is not only in Gaza. It, it went beyond. So maybe, maybe will be an opportunity. And if not, we as a Palestinian, me, and I want what I wanted to say, I have been meeting a lot of young people who lost who left Gaza to Egypt and are very angry about their leadership. They blame everybody. And they, they said, this leadership in all, all the spectrum, from A to Z, I can tell you, they, are where they were part of the problem and they will never be part of the solution because they used to be part of the problem. And they will never, and if you are, if you have been all the time part of the problem, you will never be have the opportunity or the willingness to be part of the solution. So we are talking about a new era. Israel should stop the war now, and the international community should pressure Israel to stop the war now to make things reversible. Otherwise, it will be irreversible. I can tell you also, I am I meet different people. There are some forces in the region, they don't want the war to stop. They want to use us for other things. Now, the Americans are not talking more about Iran now. They talk about Gaza more. So the Gaza war has shifted the attention from some areas, some files, to the Gaza. So some some forces in the region are not interested to have ceasefire in Gaza now. And the problem, the people, the one two million Palestinians who are in Gaza, very poor, in very tiny, tiny place. You, you can imagine you live in a cell where you are bombing every night, and you go home. And you don't know, we have a say in Palestine, I, I was there in Gaza all my life, and I feel very sorry. They say, we say, we try to make, not jokes, but if you hear the bomb, that, this means that you are not killed. Because if you don't hear it, means you are killed. Because if you are killed, you will not hear it. But as long as you hear the rocket, it means that you are okay. This is the situation. Thank you, Khaled. Thank you, Omar. Um... Uh, Obad, I want to come back to you mentioned uh, you mentioned the polling that your organization uh, Institute for Social and Economic Progress uh, has done recently, particularly since the start of this uh, assault on Gaza. Um, and so I want to focus in on two things that come out of those. Obviously, there were many more findings, but I want to focus on two. The first is a simple majority. Uh, 53 percent of West Bank Palestinians prefer to see Hamas rule in Gaza after the war to either the option of a unity government or just the return of the PA as it is. Um, so what does this tell us on the one hand about the, the relative popularity? I mean, obviously Hamas's popularity has, uh, has intensified since October 7th. Um, and, and so where does this leave Hamas versus the existing leadership? Uh, and and the second is the polls show that a majority, very large majority, I mean, a wide margin, 56 percent want to see an immediate immediate elections after the war as part of the, the post-war phase as compared with what is currently on the table of a technocratic government um, or a Fatah Hamas unity government. Um, so. What is that? I mean, obviously, there's a desire for elections, but are elections even possible in in Gaza at, at any point? Even if the if the war ends now, um, could we? Is it possible to even convene elections in this environment, uh, given the the humanitarian uh, situation? Yeah, I mean, that's probably super complicated, it, uh, impossible for probably 
I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't want to put numbers on, on the impossibility because I too vote. I, I, if I was, you know, one of these respondents, I would have said the same thing. I want elections immediately. Um, we know it's going to take minimum of two years to, to clear the rubble and the hazard and, and so on and so forth after the war is over and because before the build rebuilding and, 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 and reconstruction of Gaza even begins. Uh, but these two numbers actually related to one another and and, and they, they they interpret one another so so the over 50 percent who want to see Hamas continue to rule Gaza uh, so our interpretation is is as follows what these people are saying is basically do not decide on our do not change the status quo without asking the Palestinians so for most Palestinians Palestine is mostly um under 30 if us, uh, nearly 70 percent of people are are, are young um um and and within the youth um and and these are people who don't remember anything before Hamas so this has been the status quo for a long a very long time and at the time that we ran the poll there was a lot of talk in the media about bringing in the PA but also how what Palestinians here is bringing them in the PA on a an Israeli tank uh, or bringing in a leader from here or from there to to rule Gaza or um Arab um, you know, a, a, a lot of people ask me actually why I, you know, what I would think of Saudi room Gaza, which is, which is like pretty ridiculous. Gaza is is in Palestine and Palestinians should rule that place. So this is a vote from Palestinians to say, do not decide without us. And also Palestinians don't believe why they didn't vote for the unity government uh, that much is because they don't really believe in this Hamas Fatah situation anymore. And I'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, the Palestinians instead want elections immediately. Why they want elections immediately is because they don't want other people to decide on their behalf. So what I'm trying to say is this doesn't mean that Hamas would win the next election necessarily. Or also these, the people we ask, this is critical actually, this poll was conducted in the West Bank. So we're talking about West Bankers. I don't think that Gazans, I, I don't know, now we're running a poll in Gaza, actually. It, 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 it's a long story, but we'll find out more about what Gazans believe now. But that poll was the West, West, in the West Bank. So West Bankers don't want to change the status quo in Gaza without the Gazans and the Palestinians in general deciding that. Now, um, about the elections, it's pretty straightforward, Palestinians. So a year ago, and this finding has been consistent for a very long time ago, for a very long time, 70, 75% of Palestinians, when given choices about governance, said democracy is the way to rule Palestine. This is consistent. Uh, and when in the morning, I was talking to an American friend here, and he was joking, but maybe not joking, saying maybe there's higher support for democracy in Palestine than there is in the US. We actually will look it up later and, and find out. Um, but so Palestinians want believe in, in in democratic rule in Palestine. They want elections immediately. Massive evidence from the 2021 uh, canceled elections when young people, despite all the obstacles, a lot of money you need to put in the bank to actually sign up. You need to lose your you need to resign from your job and, and many other um, actually unnecessary obstacles in front of young people to participate. Even even so, the vast majority of the 35 lists were actually made up of independents uh, and, and of young people. So that's why people want these elections immediately. Um, so I want to go back to also build on what, what Omar and um, Leila said earlier. And I do agree, and it's also clear for quantitatively that, that we're post Hamas and Fatah. Hamas and Fatah have failed tremendously, and we have the evidence, and, and it's actually pretty funny. One of the reasons why we, one of the things we want to do at this institute, which is a, a new wish uh, from a year a year or so ago, is to actually go beyond the traditional frameworks of, of studying the Palestinian public. And what I mean by that is actually um, less than 50% of Palestinians are, are Hamas and Fatah and, and would today vote for Hamas and Fatah. So you keep asking people, would you vote for Hamas, vote for Fatah is actually, this is a question that is loaded with pretty much wrong assumptions. Most Palestinians are actually um, non-partisan at this point. So we're, we're um, you know, beyond that. And the a poll that we conducted a year ago, which looked deeply at political orientation in Palestine, using a, a, a an international framework called the Moral Foundations um, Questionnaire, showed that the Hamas and Fatah supporters have the same profile, culturally, religiously, socially, 
which basically tells you Hamas and Fatah have not organized at all for the past 17 or, or so years. So since 2007, they haven't spent any money. I don't know about spending money, but at least they haven't succeeded at organizing uh, their their public. The, the Hamas and Fatah supporters don't know the party literature, don't know clearly what these stand for. There's, they, they became more vanilla. So we're yeah. in a post-Hamas and Fatah world um, now, and I would argue that actually in an upcoming election, if there is an opportunity for independents to run f a free and democratic campaign, they would have a massive chance at winning. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. I want to I want to build on that and come back to Leila. You started raising a point before I uh, so rudely cut you off. Uh, but, uh, you know, you 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 were starting to make a point, I think, about inclusion, inclusivity. And and so I want I want you to kind of draw that out a little bit for us. Uh, elections are one way uh, to to go about this, uh, you know, getting a representative, inclusive a political uh, system. Um, but if not elections, uh, what do you see as the pathway to reviving Palestinian institutional politics? Um, a lot of people are obviously talking now about PLO reform. Um, maybe everyone except the PLO is talking about, you know, and, and that's not just bringing Hamas into the PLO, but reactivating these um, decision-making bodies like the PNC and, and the executive committee and, and, and other mechanisms within within the PLO to make it truly uh, representative. And I, I want to add to that because um, um, it's my prerogative, I suppose. Um, as someone in the diaspora and the diaspora being a constituency that has been marginalized by the PLO leadership for for decades, um, what role does the, does the Palestinian diaspora in North America or Europe or Chile or, or wherever, how can they reassert their presence on this process of reshaping and reviving Palestinian institutional politics? You're asking me many questions <laughs> in, Khaled, in a very short time. But uh, yeah, but I, I want to focus on the institutional um, dimension because it's very important. I mean, we might very well be in a post Fatah Hamas uh, world. We thought we were beyond Fatah Hamas world since 20 years, and we were not because they are institutions that have base. So I think it's very important. This is why our Palestinians are demanding dem democracy and demanding elections because that's the way by which you can revive and change that institution because you cannot do politics if there's something that proved to us. Mass polarization is important, but without political parties that can represent and absorb these movements, they, their movements will get lost uh, or will not have a, a rentable political uh, outcome. So we have a very important institution called the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. It got marginalized a bit by also, but more by the Palestinian leadership. This needs to be revived. And reviving it does not mean just including Hamas and Fatah. Actually, reviving it means taking into consideration the new political forces that are mobilized and organized on the ground. I mean, look at Obaidah's organization, look at many other organizations. We know of the election, he mentioned the elections of the preparation for the election in 2021, which were cut. They brought to the surface new political parties of young people who were presenting new agendas. So I think that's that's very important. I think you need, we need to think at more than one level. There is the PLO is an important body because also it has international legal statutes. And it is the one that under it comes the PA. The PA tried to take over the PLO, but the PLO is the, the, the umbrella that has the legal uh, uh, representation. That's an important something thing to do about. And unfortunately, the only way how it can be revived is by people who are in it, because I don't see how we're going to move those who are in it. So we could put pressure, definitely. But there's also, I need to bear in mind, the importance of developing democratic and representative institution on the ground in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, in Gaza. Because what has happened, unfortunately, over the past 20 years, 30 years, is a development of repressive uh, political organizations. And that's what needs to be shaken. And that can only be shaken by popular demand by popular mobilization, but also by support to, uh, to, to democratic reform. Like one of the things which is very interesting this time, despite the American intervention to try to bring peace, nobody's talking about elections. Usually people talk about elections. This is the one time nobody's talking about elections because they don't want change. So I think 
working on institutional representation also within the West Bank and Gaza is something very important and needs to be pushed for by by the, the young people that also Omar was talking about. I mean, they they have a right to decide their destiny and they they are now coming to, but we we need to there, there need to be an infrastructure that allows its representation rather than repressive security argument that repressive any debate. As to the role of the diaspora, I, I live in the diaspora, but I am one of those, I believe the diaspora plays a very important role to support the liberation movement and the liberation struggle. But those who will liberate Palestine are those who are living in Palestine. I am always of that opinion. Those who are outside, we've been, we've, this moment has proved that the diaspora played a very important role because we're in the diaspora, especially in America and in, in the West, they're organized, the, the diaspora learned to play the tricks and the tools of their respective countries. There's a strong legal strategy and legal campaign in the US that we did not see 30 years ago, or electoral, electoral campaign on Palestine that we did not see before. This all centers the Palestinian questions right and center, and that's an incredible achievement. But it will get wasted if there is not a leadership and a representative leadership that can mobilize it for the cause of liberation. So we have, as Omar said, we have incredible, we can turn this into an opportunity. The way we turn it into opportunity is by emphasizing accountability and the unity of the Palestinian people, of the Palestinian struggle, and of the, the, the justice of our struggle for liberation. That's, and I, and I see pressure for it. The problem is now, as we're trying to, the war will come, we're gonna go through phases. There's, as we said, there's the first phase of stopping the war of the technocratic government, whatever it is, it's the management of the post-reconstruction. This is not gonna go, this is gonna go in tandem with all the uh, other political mechanism to democratize the Palestinian political system. But as Omar explained also very beautifully, we are in a regional context that is not conducive, neither to unity, nor to democracy, nor to debate. And how we as Palestinians in our various places are gonna push for our rights by understanding both the regional and international configuration that's gonna determine our success or failure. Uh, thank you, thank you for that, Leila. So we have just uh, around uh, seven minutes or so, and so I'm gonna ask you the same each the same question, and we'll do a kind of lightning round, and I'm gonna ask you to 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 answer in about one or two minutes each. But basically, I think. You all have laid out this this reality that there and there's a there's also there's a question. I mean, the, the, the question in my mind is, OK, how do we go about doing this? How do Palestinians go about doing this? What is the process? What are the next steps um, and what role do legacy political actors like Hamas, Fatah, PFLP and so and so forth? Uh, what is their responsibility and and existing institutions and and. You know, we have a question in uh, in the in the Q and A box about is there a possibility of new civil infrastructure that could emerge, new political forces somehow, or maybe even new institutions. So, what is the recipe of old versus new? Um, what is the sequence of events? And especially given that there are many different outside actors, first and foremost, Israel, who will directly affect realities on the ground. We know the Israeli vision of remaining in Gaza indefinitely, no return of the PA and so forth, uh, more or less permanent occupation. Um, how do Palestinians recapture the agency even if they don't have the power, right? So I know that's a lot throwing at you, but, but what is your vision? If you could redesign Palestinian politics going forward, how, what would it look like? in two minutes each. So I'm going to start with uh, with Omar and then Obada and then we'll end with Leila. Thank you again, Khaled. We have the recipe. Five things. First, Israel need to debar, must depart, leave the mentality of punishment to the mentality of the reward. They have tried 17 years of siege, blockade, draining Gaza into garbage, garbage Gaza into radical, those audience should know Gaza. Gaza was very mosaic, liberal, open-minded society. Gaza, part of the Mediterranean, one of the oldest cities in the world. There were 7,000 Christians. I love Gaza so much. I have been to America 10 times. I love it. But I want to talk to go about Gaza tomorrow. I'm very devastated. 
Gaza is the bridge between Asia and Africa. So we need to look at the big picture. And thank you for jo Jonathan, who shared my article about Gaza. So does I need to try a new element? Second, I said this to the Israeli directly. The Israeli created the problem, which is the siege. They asked somebody else to solve it, the Qatari, the UN, and they are the one who paid the price. The 7th of October attack was against the Israelis. So the Israeli, at the end of the day, they are the one who harvest the mistake of their policies. And the, I know, you know, and as I know, I don't want to share everything, but I know that you know that the 7th of October attack was triggered by outside element. They really need to understand this is their mistake and need they, they have to blame themselves. Third, we can to, not only me, in the, 20, in the one election of 21, May 21, that was supposed to happen, where the President Abbas the, the postponed it in the background of Israel's rejection to Jerusalem, there were 36 candidate lists. 36, 26 of them are young people. I stood the candidate myself in 1996 election. I was 31 years old. I want to build my country. I love Gaza. I know the Israeli. I know Hebrew. I feel that I can do something. But the leadership, PLO, who came from outside, they didn't believe in us. So this is not the issue. So the new generation are the Palestinian. Two-thirds of the Palestinian people are young, under 30 years, and, and they are educated. And there are 5,000 outside. Last thing about reputation, popularity of Hamas. It's easy. But also, if you ask, the popularity of the PA in Gaza is much higher than it when the West Bank. The paradoxical thing, Khalid, is both parties count on popularity in area that they don't govern. Like the like Joe Biden count on Mexican people. Or the Mexican president count on the Australian. People in the West Bank, because they are angry with the PA, they are angry with the occupation, they see the Gaza war as something. Yes, I am, have been to France, I have been to Brussels, I met the Palestinians here in Egypt and there, who are very thick, but can they? Can you ask them to come to Gaza to live? No. The popularity of the, the, what happened 7 October was shocking to everybody, and the war has changed the mentality of the people. Last thing, last thing. It depends on us. If these people, I, I met some European delegate who first in Cairo today and asked me, Omar, will you go back? Yes, I want to go back. I used to work with an international organization, humanitarian. I'm so good. I have good experience with young people. But what can I do there? There is no water. There is no health. So the Israeli need to, um, to think about bringing, allowing more people to come back and to live and to establish their own country. We have to decide. And I don't feel comfortable when I talk with Americans from Washington or somebody from UK, and they said, what about this person from Washington? We need to focus on the process, not in the people. Yeah, thank you. We need process. The process is election, democracy, not only. And who, 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 then election... Why we don't intervene in the American uh, election? You should not intervene us. And we are adult and we are matured and we are educated and we know English. And the literacy rate in Palestine is only 1%, one of the highest in the world. Yeah. Thank you very much. Th thank you, Omar. Um, we're, we're slightly, we're going to go a little bit over time because we want to hear from both Obada and, and, and Leila. But uh, please, if you could do it in one to two minutes. I know it's, it's a tall order, but uh, Obada, please. Yeah, so um, first of all, there's a, there's a wider framing. The wider framing is as follows. First of all, the, the PA, PLO leadership that exists now and Hamas both need to understand and to be held responsible for potentially a failure in capturing the current opportunity. They need to understand that if they fail to capture the current opportunity that is paid for in 30,000 lives and, and many more injured and, and maybe 2 million and also others in the West Bank in, in psychological issues and so on and so forth. If they fail to capture this, they'll come down as the failed leadership, which failed its people multiple times and, and continue to fail them just because they like the, the chairs that they're sitting on. That's one. The second part of this wider framing is that we, in as as people who advocate and speak and research and, and, and so on, need to hold them accountable in as lo as much as we can. So we should all actually write in articles out there, speak to you know, Omar and Layla and Khaled, each within our circles, to all these people who matter, the stakeholders, and tell them, listen, you, you, you've got to put pressure, pressure on these people. We need to frame the situation so that actually, if they fail, they'll come down and they'll, they'll go down in history as having failed their people. So this is this is the wider framing. And then the technical stuff is, is, I think, is pretty straightforward. 
the technocratic government is important, but it cannot be a a, a just uh, the face of reform, but not real reform. So it cannot just be you know you know President Abbas's favorite uh, person or or the safest bet or something like that. It needs to be real actors who have real power. This these real actors that have real power. One, declare the date of elections, even if it's two years from now, even if it's a year and a half from now, whenever that is. And then they work with the international community to make it happen. There's technology to make it happen today as well. That's one. Two, they go out and, and build bridges with, with, the, with, the air, with the air world because this is really important. It's really important for the reconstruction. They go talk to, to the Saudis, the Emiratis, the, to the Kuwaitis, the Qataris, um, and, and to the Jordanians, the Egyptians, everybody who matters there. To make sure that there's alignment and they bring in people to invest first. So actually it's investment in long-term stability. So they can there can be a political process built on it. And then from there, whoever comes out and so reconstruction begins and then elections begin uh, take place. And then whoever takes the elections, like Omar said, they, they take that burden and, and move it forward. And I'll stop here. Thank you, Abada. Leila, you have the last word. Uh <laughs> I agree with all what Omar and Obada said. I would just, I see the process going, first of all, the war has to stop and international pressure in the US has a very big responsibility in that regard to stop the war right now. I think there will be a technocratic government. And as I said, Obada said, the process would be to ensure and promise that there would be elections. But I also say it's very important to or do capitalize and push for the revival of the PLO because this is something, it is the only institution that we have that represents all the Palestinians. This needs to happen and can happen. And I do believe there are new forces organizing on the ground that will continue organizing and that are need to hold the, those leaders accountable. But this also ties with the fourth issue, which is going to be very difficult, the issue of security, that Israel is always going to insist and Arab countries are going to exist. And the big problem we have is that we have a securitization of politics without accountability. And that's what we need to make sure is held into accountability. Thank you. Uh, I want thank you all for a really, really rich discussion. Um, thank you, uh, Omar um, and uh, Obada and Leila. Thank you to our audience for indulging us and in staying a little bit longer. Um, if you want to catch a recording of uh, of the uh, event today, it will be up on our website soon. Um, and again, thank you all for a really, really rich discussion. And we hope to see you all back uh, next time, next time around. And uh, stay safe.